Hello. Okay. Yeah, great. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this hybrid event taking place both in the Museum of Finnish Architecture and online. My name is Maria Rautharju. I work as the head of exhibitions here in the Museum of Finnish Architecture. During this weekend, we gather to this Long Live Vivi Learn festival to celebrate the 150th birthday of architect Vivi Learn, the first woman architect to run her own architect's office in Finland. We are also celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Finnish Association of Women Architects, Architecta, Architecta, a pioneer in the field of women architects organizations internationally. Our current exhibition, Long Live Vivilan, also encourages do we, is it all right with the, yeah, yeah, great, yeah. Also encourages us to celebrate uh, we will learn, the Vivilans of our time, the doers and thinkers that for one reason or another are ma marginalized in this field and profession of architecture. The celebration started yesterday, have continued today and will continue tomorrow on Sunday. So please do take a look at the at our festival program at uh, www.mfa.fi website. Just a second. Everything's great. Um, <laughs> This is, the, this is my slapstick part. Okay, we're done. Uh, yeah, I will continue a bit. Uh, so we have invited the Frame Contemporary Art Finland to join us to celebrate and bro broaden the questions of equity, equality, architecture and space to even more intersection, intersection directions and to bridge practices of art and architecture. This redistribution event is hosted by Frame Contemporary Art Finland as a part of their Rehearsing Hospitalities program and as collaboration with the anti-racist platform Stop Hatred Now and us, the museum. Uh, we thank you for this collaboration and participation. And so before, before, before we, no, let's see. Yes, thank you. Before we start the discussion, I want to remind everyone about the principle of safer space uh, that are used both by the Museum of Finnish Architecture as well as Frame Contemporary Art Finland. In this event and the museum in general, we want everyone to have a safe experience and to be able to participate as themselves without fear of discrimination or harassment. Um, the principle of uh, safer space can be found here in the museum in the leaflets uh, for those who are present and also uh, in the museum website and probably we will be linking them on the event chat for those who are participating mainly online. Also, uh, you can find it, the museum's principles here in the first floor lobby of the museum. So I will now give the floor to Jussi Koitela, head of program of FRAME, and Jussi will introduce this afternoon panel in more detail. Thank you and welcome. Okay. 
Um, better, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, welcoming World Maria. <laughs> uh, uh, and yes, this event happens here in the space, but also it's streamed online. This uh, a sound and uh, live captions of, of this uh, talk and to uh, conversation. Uh, so people can also participate online and, and see the stream on Frames YouTube channel and uh, also on the website of Stop Hatred Now. Uh, so, this redistribution roundtable discussion uh, uh, presents different approaches uh, to redistribution of power and wealth uh, while examining inst institutional and educational in infra architectures. Uh, this is part of the Frames Rehearsing Hospitalities program, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's the program we have we've been running uh, from 2019 uh, and it has, has different focuses, kind of interlinking with each other. Uh, and this year uh, the program focuses on kind of uh, to ha how to deal with the redistribution of power, wealth and resources um, in the field of art, uh, but also in the society larger and how those, two, like how those things can be interlinked with each other. Uh, I just mentioned quickly, uh, we have uh, uh, Reishab, Anse and Camilo who is running the uh, technical setting. Uh, Laura from Frame is doing some social media things somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, so this is the, I just want to thank them already in the before and also all of our partners and the speakers who I'm going to introduce you soon. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this works in online and in here. Uh, you can uh, actually, we can, we will have the co some co uh, questions and comments in the later part of the conversation here in the space, in the physically. Uh, but you can also access the chat uh, through the QR code, QR code in the leaflet. So, it is possible to actually like. To, to write on the chat also in the phone, and the chat is also paid, uh, linked to the online audiences. Um, so, yes. Um, now I just say a few words about the speakers, and I just want to also, uh, maybe in some point Noah can say if, if he doesn't hear, hear us. Noah is from speaking from New York, but I will uh, start with the um, Ale, Ale Manchi Amiken, who is here. Um, uh, he is a researcher in the issues of race and racism, anti racism, and anti racism edu education. Uh, his research focuses on developing different strategies of meto and methods of anti racism, anti racism education in and out of schools. He is currently a program director for Master of Social Ex Exclusion at Aarhus Academy University uh, in Finland. Uh, each of the speakers will present quickly or like somehow uh, say some, like around 10 minutes at the beginning uh, and then we have a short break and then we go into conversation. Uh, then we have Milla Kallio here. Uh, uh, Milla Kallio is a co-founder of FEMA Planning, an urban planning collective specialized in participatory planning. Uh, they are studying places and their identities as well as the experiences of residents together with local actors. Uh, and then we have uh, Noah Fisher speaking from New York uh, through online connection. Um, uh, Noah is a Brooklyn based maker, performer, teacher whose work, work asks how is art affected by financial power and what can be done about his about uh, about that. Uh, his work has been seen uh, within and without invitation, for example at Guggenheim Museum, Mo MoMA uh, Museum of Modern Art, Brooklyn Museum and Venice Biennial, or 56th Venice Biennial, uh, Berlin Biennial and Whitney Biennial. Uh, yes. Um, so, we have a short presentations by the speakers and then we have a break and then we go into conversations. Uh, but I just wanted to say quickly that I asked uh, some of the sp speakers to actually like open up uh, or answer some couple of questions related 
from their own perspective and from their pra practice uh, and the position where they come from. They are about like uh, questions how uh, power and, and wealth is, is accumulating in the in the institutional and public context, uh, in, the pers in the fields where they work, and what can be done for that through the, through the practices what they are working on. Um, and we uh, start with Alemanchi. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today. And, um, when you sent me the, the questions that you wanted me to reflect on, it reminded me of a question I was asked by a friend a few years ago. That question was, look around you. Um, everything that you see is uh, made by whites. The, 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 this, actually, the civilization that we have today is designed by whites. Can you argue that whites are not a superior race? It took me a while to answer that question by the person who asked the question. And um, actually, I gave an answer which was like very vague. When I went home and thought about it, I realized that I didn't answer the question fairly. So maybe I have a chance to answer it today better. So, power and wealth. My father is a farmer in Cameroon. He works six days a week. But he is considered poor. Finnish farmers, my, uh, my daughter's grandfather is a, is a farmer as well, a Nastola. He only farms in the summer. But he's far richer than my father, who works six days a week, every day throughout the, uh, six days a week, every week throughout the year. The question is, why? So if we go back to look at the world in which we live in, one of the things that we have to understand, I'm going to cite uh, one of my friends, uh, Kendi Andrews, who says that the world can only be as just, as fair, as equal, as the knowledge upon which it's built. So if you think about justice, freedom, equality, you have to ask yourself, what knowledge are you basing your understanding of freedom, justice, fairness, equity, and equality? So I want, to, I want us to go back to, to in the past to kind of understand why, where we are today. I uh, consider the 15th century as the most defining period, which has actually influenced who we are and what we are today. And uh, a lot of things happened during the 15th century, but the most significant thing that happened in the 15th century was the discovery of uh, America by Christopher Columbus. Uh, before that time, Europe was not on top of the world. Europe was as was the same like any other continent. But upon discovery of uh, the new world, uh, Europeans could go in there and um, the first thing they did was they committed a, um, a genocide, killed the people and took, started, started mining the gold. But gold wasn't what made Europe successful. What made Europe successful was farming in the new world. They could farm sugar, and cotton. And that gave Europeans an edge in terms of civilization, in terms of race, in terms of everything else. Because based on the produce from sugar and, uh, and cotton in the New World, Europe actually, actually they went to Africa, told the Africans that you're not good enough, you're, you are less than humans, we'll take you there, we'll take you to the, we'll take you to the Americas where you can work as slave and use that wealth to build Europe. So Europe is built upon the sweat and blood of other racial groups or other people in different parts of the world. So if you think about the superiority and wealth and power that we have in Europe today, it all stems back from what happened then in the 15th century. But that wasn't just the only significant thing that happened. Um, in 1735, um, 
Carl Linnaeus, who was, who, was, who, was a, who was a Swedish botanist. He was the first person who came up with this whole idea of um, racial hierarchies. He actually argued that, he's the first person who said that actually, we are we humans, we are actually, humans are, uh, we, we need to be studied based on a bio or based on biology. Because before him, we all, the world looked, the world, what was dominant or was predominant at that time was religion. So everything was viewed from the framework of religion. But what Kalinius came, what he argued was that we have to, that there are, there are four different racial groups. And uh, he divided the world according to four different racial groups. And he had Eurocepian uh, Europas, which were those from the Europe. There were, he gave them specific qualities, for example. These people were smart, they had blue eyes, they had blonde hair, they were inventive, uh, they were ruled by law. The second group was um, European Europas, or uh, Asiaticus, the Asians. And um, you know, these were basically um, people from the Middle East. And he said that these guys were, they were rash, they were passionate, they were not ruled by law, they were ruled by custom. And then he, he, he created a, fourth, a third racial group, which was the US European Americanus, and then US European Affair. So basically, he set the tone for the kind of racism that we have today. But interestingly, in 1735, Finland was under Sweden. However, Finland wasn't part of the European Europas racial group. Finland was, Finland was viewed as an, in, as a people from an inferior race. They were viewed as people from Euro Sapien Asiaticus. How, so basically, today, we, those of us in Finland who are white, we celebrate our whiteness and think we are, we are, we are white. But there's been a process through which Finland has become white. And Finland became white by actually showing that it had more in common with those who were white and less in common with those who were non-white. So basically, the whole issue of power and race is that for Finland to become white, Finland had to sacrifice racial, uh, racial groups like the Samis and the Romas so that Finland would be viewed as worthy enough to be admitted into the white uh, Chambers. Okay, so he had showed that because for there to be a mountain, there has to be a valley. Without a valley, there can't be a mountain. So Finland, it was about sacrificing the other for them to be superior. And this didn't end then. It's something that is continuously happening today in Finland. And as the research of race and racism, something I deal with all the time. When we talk about race and racism, a lot of time people think that it's People have simplified it to good or bad. So people think that, oh, I know that racism is bad. That means that I don't have to learn about it anymore. And um, I kind of always try to challenge people to think deeper and think more into what they mean by just the dangers of simplifying racism. I'm a black man, and I work in a university. Oftentimes, what I usually tell my, 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 my peers is that I work as a gatekeeper in a white institution, although I am, I am I'm black. So I have to always ask myself, so where do, how do I position myself as a gatekeeper? Because as a gatekeeper, I also have to maintain the powers or the or boundaries set aside or set for me by, uh, by whiteness or white structures. So I struggle with this all the time and, uh, and um, some people have asked me, but why don't you just leave? And I said, what I do in my job is that I create a sabotage from within. Because with my privilege and power in working at Finnish Academia, I can force the Finnish Academia to think about racism. I can make changes within uh, Finnish Academia. For example, when I, was, um, when I got the job at Oba Academy, the first thing I did was I discussed with them and I said, hey, look, this big problem, and I can't, I can't work in this environment. And they said, what? And I said, presently, you have this 
language tested for people who are coming from out of Finland or out of Europe, they have to go and write this, um, this test, which is usually um, a TOEFL or ELTS, which proves that, which actually it is to test them to see if they are they can they can they can they can learn and write in English. They can they can study in English. I said that is very racist because these are some of the people who some of these people are coming from countries who are former English colonies and they've spoken they've studied all their lives in English, and um, you're asking them to go pay to write an exam to show or to prove that. They are worthy to come and study here. And remember, this exam is only certificate is only valid for two years, which means that if you have a, if you even have a pass after two years, that certificate is not valid anymore. So that means that you're gonna that, that means that you you're gonna forget your language skills after two years. So that's a little bit questionable. So what I said was, this has to change. We can't work like this. And um, we changed the whole structure in a way that now. In my program at uh, Ob Academy, people don't have to write a test, but we can do an interview where we can assess everyone's language. Whether you are European or non-European, you all participate in that interview. And uh, that's one way of kind of creating equity in my work. So there are a lot of different ways people can do, but we have to also understand that to create equity or to fight for equity or, or equality, the strategies that you're going to use if you are an insider, so it's very different from the strategies that you're going to use if you're an outsider. But the most important thing that you have to understand or, or try to gauge is that try to only attempt to solve the problems that you can solve. Do not bite more than you can chew. However, it's important to always strive to do something. Doing something is better than nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Alain uh, I think we're going to next hear from Milla. Uh, and also maybe, yeah, there's a lot of the points to kind of uh, discuss more. But I think what you've been also doing with, uh, with the FEMA planning is very much about thinking about agency and who and how people, individuals are we viewed when, uh, when they have an agency or when they have a, when, when they have a power to change. So maybe you can speaks also about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah, let's see how much time there is, but hopefully in the discussion part at least we can um, con concentrate on those questions as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Um, uh, so I'm the other founder of Femme Planning. My colleague Efe Okbede couldn't make it today, but uh, very, very happy to have such a large audience today as well. It's exciting after all those, all these years of uh, online communications with people. Um, but maybe I'll start with a bit of FEMA and what we've been doing and our perspectives on this topic. Um, so we've been running FEMA planning for um, about three years now. Before, before we started this company, we also uh, did a, a few projects as a collective, but now we are both uh, doing um, business projects as a company and then more of these uh, free um, or art-related projects with uh, different fundings. But uh, me and Efe are both um, urban geographers by our background, um, educational background, so we studied uh, a bit of architecture and urban planning, sociology, stuff like that, but mostly at FEMA um, also we look at places and um, identities that are connected to those places and the residents who use those spaces. Um, but um, why urban planning in our, or my opinion at least, is very interesting in this perspective is that um, urban planning has a major impact on how we live, how we reside and how we work, how we move around the city and who we meet also in the city. Um, yeah, but it's also a very slow process. It might take 10 years to, to plan something and to build something, be it um, transport lanes or be it new housing areas or, or whatnot. It's a very complicated process. Um, but it's 
uh, why we are focusing on participation in urban planning is that nowadays, at least in Finland, it's required by law um, that whenever you build something new or design a new uh, part of the city, for example, um, it's required by law that people have to be able to participate in those processes and their opinions need to be taken into consideration. Um, but then a few years back, um, related to this law as well, we did a study at FEMA uh, related to people's experiences in these uh, land use processes. And the findings were that people felt like these processes were not um, actually equal or fair in their opinions, and they didn't feel like they had a true um, possibility to actually be part of those processes. But they felt that they were the land use uh, projects were mainly, um, of course directed by the urban planners, but also that the participatory methods that were used were quite shallow and not um, giving the residents a real opportunity to take part in these planning processes. So this then leads to obviously a lot of mistrust towards the planners and towards the um, political institutions that kind of run the whole thing, of course, as well. So um, then based on this finding as well, we've come to the conclusion that um, there is of course these unequal power relations uh, in urban planning as well, who gets to um, be part of the processes and who gets to impact those, uh, who actually has the possibility to uh, participate in these processes, whether it's about uh, different social um, resources people need to have, whether it's about time, whether it's about having childcare for your kids so that you can participate in some workshop or discussion, for example, um, or whether it's about having prior knowledge um, or knowing the right people to, to talk to, for example. Um, but these, these different um, resources that people have in their use or the diversity of people who um, reside in different areas of the city, for example, is not that well taken into consideration in urban planning nowadays. So that's why we are focusing on participatory urban planning, that um, we think that there should be more ways to uh, include people in the urban planning processes and that they could be more, more diverse as, as the people who live in our cities as well. Um, then different power relations that are also connected with urban planning is, is of course uh, those people who decide, whether it be politicians or urban planners, but um, I think especially, or at least I know that in Helsinki, many of the city council uh, members mostly live in central areas in the city or wealthy areas in the city, which of course then also impacts uh, the questions that are dealt with in the uh, political sphere of um, urban planning. And um, I also think it has an impact on how we define what is good environment or what is, um, what is good city in a way, that what are the qualities that are needed for it and who do we actually design it for. So mostly uh, urban planners are quite similar from their backgrounds as well and socioeconomic statuses as well and that also has an impact on who they think that they are studying, uh, planning the city for and how they imagine the city to be used. But in reality there are many ways um, people use the space in cities and many ways they would like to use the space but maybe nowadays cannot use it in ways that they would hope. Um, yeah, so then what can be done about it? Um, yeah, so we, we think that, um, of course, with these participatory methods as well, we want to bring these topics into discussion a bit more, that what kind of power relations are related to urban planning processes and how we could change them and what are the values that urban planning is based on as well, whether it be 
markets or of prices or monetary values or whether there's some other values that we should consider in more detail. Then of course um, a lot of the policies and plans should be uh, scrutinized a bit more in detail to see how the inequality between different areas for example is firstly created because nowadays in urban planning uh, many times there's a focus on uh, different minorities or immigrant background people or people with uh, lower income for example and they are kind of seen as as the issue or, or the problem and the actual reason for this uh, for segregation for example or for different issues in the urban fabric is not very well uh, scrutinized then when it comes to participatory planning I also think that we should be better at acknowledging people's own actions when it comes to, for example, their uh, own living environments. Many times in urban planning we kind of blame people for not participating in workshops or questionnaires or different events, for example, but then we fail to recognize their own actions in uh, their neighborhoods, for example. Uh, when it's not connected to the official um, participatory uh, ways that the city, for example, has. Um, yeah, maybe related to that, we've also uh, started this platform called Lahia Laboratoria, so suburb laboratory, maybe, roughly translated, and also run a few of these campfire events where we wanted to kind of raise up the question of uh, being present in, in certain neighborhoods that are being planned or redeveloped or where there's, uh, for example, demolitions going on and new constructions planned. Um, but at least in Helsinki, most of the urban planners are centralized in the city or in the central uh, part of the town. And of course, they sometimes visit these other suburbs and neighborhoods, but um, not really being there uh, with the people and experiencing the, the neighborhood as, as the people who live there experience their everyday lives. So we think that it would be important uh, to just not just look from afar, but to actually be present in the everyday life. And then maybe finally, as we are here today as well, I think it's, it's very important to uh, discuss and make visible these power structures and values that are related to urban planning and, and architecture as well, so that we could eventually have more, more diverse values and more diverse spaces for, through planning as well. Thanks. Thank you, Milla. Uh, I think, uh, yes, so much questions bubbling in my mind and the kind of connections between your, between your uh, talks. Uh, just then we go to Noah's uh, turn and Noah's Fisher's turn. Um, and also, he has time about similar time, like about 10 minutes, and then we have a short break uh, and then we have a conversation. Um, Noah, hopefully, let's. Can you hear me? Yes, I think we can hear you. Good. Okay, apologies, mine is actually a little longer. I don't know how to deal with that, uh, but I'm gonna start. So, um, so uh, I wanna speak on left-wing populism in connection to redistribution, gatekeeping, and cultural institutions. So let me tell a quick story of my work in the last decade or so uh, to bring out some examples and questions related to this theme. It's of course in the US context that I'm speaking and I understand that in the Finnish context because of the funding structures, it's very different. Maybe that will lead to some interesting discussions. So I wanna begin with the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was a left populist movement seen in its famous line, we are the 99%. In Occupy Wall Street, we spoke in phrases such as the game is rigged. And this was meant to point out the ubiquitous revolving door between public and private institutions in the, in the US specifically. And that where the same people would serve the public good only to turn around and work against the public for private accumulation. I mean, nor, this had been highly normalized in the US and it still is today. 
So to, to use an example, which I'll try to carry throughout my talk, my short presentation, take the figure of Larry Fink. Fink was a CEO of a then smallish financial security company called BlackRock. In 2008, Fink was called into the Federal Reserve to help sort out the bad housing debts. And soon af after that bit of service, apparently having absorbed valuable public knowledge and government connections, BlackRock grew astronomically in size to today become a $10 trillion uh, asset manager, the largest financial company in the world. The steep rise of BlackRock after 2008 tracks with the diverging outcomes of the rich and the middle class and the poor because the debts which BlackRock traded were simultaneously acting as assets for the rich and sort of chains for everybody else. I mentioned Larry Fink because he is also an important art world figure, a collector and a trustee at the Museum of Modern Art. From within the Occupy movement, I co-formed a group called Occupy Museums, which work to connect left populism to the discourse around art institutions. We did this through direct actions. At first, people asked, why are you attacking the museums? Why not the bad institutions like the banks? Um, here's why. We thought the leading art institutions played an important role in the sort of power the elites were concentrating, specifically the financial and real estate industries, but not only, uh, that, 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 that were represented by trustees and funders, for example. This power concerned their reputations and their social licenses to operate. There were other reasons, such as the art market being a site of global money laundering. And strategically, we saw the museums as the softest of the major institutions. They were more vulnerable because the elites wanted something from the public. They were trying to develop their reputations. In other words, they were claiming public service. And so they would care more if there was bad press. Uh, one example of our actions was at MoMA, where Larry Fink was a trustee. MoMA and Sotheby's shared some trustees at the time. We marched and occupied and hung banners in the museum to call out this conflict of interest because it was easy to imagine that what was shown at MoMA could be driven by a profit motive uh, because of the link between the, the private market. And so the public was, in essence, used in that transaction. And at the same time, Sotheby's was busy trying to destroy their union, their art handlers union. Now here's the issue. Of course, Sotheby's and MoMA both speak with a language of progressive social values, but they were proudly anti-labor and anti-redistribution. And in our series of direct action, we succeeded in changing public opinion on this to see that it does make sense to target US museums. But a change to the work occurred between the years 2014 and 16. 2014 was Black Lives Matter, a long awaited resurgence of the civil rights movement, which in the US also marked a shift away from concern with financial inequality and towards identity. Of course, many left-wing activists and figures such as Bernie Sanders, Reverend Barber, were trying to create interracial working class movements. But more commonly, we saw the two come apart and nowhere more so and more successfully than in the larger cultural institutions. Um, when, when Trump was elected, this became even easier for them to do. Trump was an activist in a way and he was very good at picking on targets. And his movement used cultural institutions and academia and sometimes even individual artists to harness right-wing populist, white supremacist resentment at the elite gatekeepers. For example, accusing Marina Abramovich of Satan worship. Contemporary art is unfortunately very good in this role of illustrating elite excess. And in fact, it could be said in the US that is perhaps its only legible role on a national level. And this is one of our challenges for left populism in the arts. Well, Trumpism led to two things in terms of institutions. First, we saw continued expansion of the direct actions towards museums. But now, since white supremacy was on the march, 
the left-wing actions were almost always carried out in the name of anti-racism and decolonial politics. Some examples, the 2017 Whitney Biennial protest against the white artist painting the lynching uh, of a black boy named Emmett Till, or the removal of Confederate and other racist statues. Uh, so representation came to the front in activism. Secondly, we saw movement in the art world to rally around institutions, which were apparently under attack. And this became an anti -pop, a very popular anti-populism. Um, and, and in the name of values that, that were different from the values Trump was espousing. But values can be cheap. Uh, we began to see an extremely warm embrace by elite institutions of progressive values. <clears throat> Uh, but they were almost always laser focused on identity, seen in exhibitions, programming, collecting, and also the quite successful push in diversity, equity, inclusion, and hiring. And this can, of course, seem, be seen as a win. But unfortunately, it's uh, from the, especially from a less populist perspective, it's a win within a zero sum game. Uh, because this reflection of progressive social values has acted as a kind of fog to obscure the fact that the institutions are more than ever intimately tied to the wealth gap, which is growing unstoppably the whole time. And we begin to forget that left politics even concerns this wealth gap at all. And so the Trump years saw the near death of left-wing populism in the art institutions, meaning that it was almost impossible to find art that was connected to the theme of economic redistribution. Um, in fact, in the years between 2016 and today, class anger pointing the finger directly at financial inequality or elites even became a code for right-wing populism. In other words, it practically became a code for racism. To, and to continue now tracking Larry Fink in BlackRock, I should mention that he was spoken of as a likely pick for both Trump and Hillary, the Democrats, Secretary of the Treasury, which illustrates how financial power supersedes this cultural divide. Um, and we organized protests against Fink because he was one of Trump's economic advisors. Fink resigned, and this was seen at the time as a sort of victory, but I'm not sure in retrospect that it was a victory because what has been created is a new reality where there can be no more association between cultural institutions and right-wing or conservative social values. Museums must espouse progressive social values. And this may sound good to leftists, but we can begin to see the trap that arises from it. Um, by the end of the Trump regime, Larry Fink had successfully remade himself into one of the most powerful progressive voices in the country. He used his $10 trillion platform to speak for decarbonization of the economy, gun control, and diversity, equity, inclusion in the corporate sphere. Uh, and Fink has become representative of what we see from elite institutions in the United States, which is spotless expressions of progressive values, um, and, but in part because figures like Fink have been able to position themselves as progressive leaders financial inequality remains a blind spot in a structural sense. And, and why have we arrived here? Um, well, of course, we have our problems in the US with polarization and deadlock. And I understand that for activists, the push for to look at history, anti-racism is, um, it, it seems to be what's possible. You know, the push for economic redistribution looks impossible, and it may be impossible in the US. There's also a long history of US institutions being allied with the 1%, unlike in Finland. Figures like Rockefeller and Frick gave rise to philanthropy as the major social pillar in the late 1800s. And to change that, one would have to unleash ma massive public funding, and the, the culture wars makes that impossible. Um, but as a left populist, I'm committed to thinking about how it can become truly more public. And we have to be careful in how we use the word public in these spaces. And who are we including? 
Unfortunately, in the U.S., uh, much of the country, public has no interest in the cultural institutions and will never walk into their doors. Um, would it be possible to even think about cultural institutions that could be relevant to the entire public? That would mean appealing across race, class, but even harder and perhaps more crucial, rural and urban divides and the cultural divides between traditional and progressive values embodied there. Um, I think spaces might exist in this direction. I'm almost finished. Um, one provocative example I want to end with thinking about crypto art that I've been looking at and studying. There, it's a very messy space, um, they, but they can bridge between geographical divides because it's, it's all online. And what's interesting to me is that these are spaces sometimes in the NFTs, the crypto art space, that it's ideologically very diverse, which is a, it's very hard to find spaces that are ideologically diverse. And actually also racially, those spaces turn out to be much more diverse than cultural institutions. Crypto prides itself on decentralization, not beholden to traditional gatekeepers. Such spaces are, in a sense, naturally populist, and yet, they're, they're, of course, they're completely beholden to the dynamics of the market, in other words, to the core of capitalism. So I basically leave with that strange contradiction, which is an, a thought, but it's a messy one, and perhaps to bring that into the conversation. Thank you. minutes breaks so you can go to the toilet and have a water if you have the water uh, and then we come back to the conversation yeah please come back don't leave yeah <laughs> thank you Laura.
Okay, now, now, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, thanks for the short uh, presentations. Uh, uh, I just wanted to like maybe continue, uh, uh, pa start the discussion part by asking you, um, uh, I will come maybe in the, I just want to say in the later phase, I think want to discuss something what Noah mentioned about this. Um, Position between the between the uh, like a leftist or populist leftist position between the distribution of wealth and the identity politics, which is I think is the kind of uh, something uh, confrontation or, or uh, challenge which is somehow hanging in the, in the air in the kind of current uh, social discussions or political discussions maybe. So it would be nice to kind of go that, but I don't want to go it directly. I uh, just wanted to maybe hear. Just uh, ask from all of you, uh, 
you also already somehow discussed it about it. Uh, but when we were speaking earlier, I was very kind of a thought or thought quite a lot of that, like how one or individual or community or group of people uh, become or or you all came somehow maybe some historic his, uh, kind of a history examples of that or understand like how how people become someone who can be in the power who can position power uh, who can um, who can use wealth or, or direct flow of capital or something like that uh, or who has the agency um, it's interesting to somehow kind of a maybe like speak about that or um, how how this happens in your field uh, you all all somehow maybe touch it upon this a little bit uh, but would be nice to hear I would like to just hear a little bit more about that uh, but maybe I will just maybe start from Mila you now because you're next to me but also uh, <laughs> that because maybe this is something that uh, in the field of urban planning and the kind of participatory planning or participatory processes uh, you kind of very clearly stated somehow that uh, like there are participatory processes and participation but of course there are certain people and certain groups of people who might participate and someone might not participate so maybe how this has happened in the in the field of urban planning and how it kind of continues to happen yeah thanks um very complicated question <laughs> um yeah but definitely it happens and maybe i briefly touched upon it um, as well but i feel like one of the um, things historically with urban planning is that it has previously been done um, quite exclu exclusively only by architects um, and nowadays a bit by geographers and and, and things like that but um, the, the profession is quite limited like there isn't that many um, people from different uh, fields of study or different backgrounds or anything like that so then um, the how we perceive urban planning has been quite restricted in that sense because it comes from certain uh, field of study and fr from certain history as well. And um, that has been quite central in, in Finland, I think, um, as well. And maybe more recently the, the field has kind of broadened its perspective that there could be more different kinds of uh, professionals working with urban planning. There should be more um, uh, psychologists or sociologists or, or uh, people with those kind of backgrounds as well. Um, in many countries in, in Europe, um, there's a different profession or different um, study track altogether to be an urban planning uh, professional, which doesn't exist in Finland yet. Uh, at least so that's also like one of the differences i think between finland and many other other countries yeah maybe you can continue or yeah let's, let's just continue uh yeah uh, just i came to finland 14 years ago and uh, when i came to finland 14 years ago I was entering a space or a country which was very foreign to me. When when I when I when I when I, when I landed at Helsinki Airport or Vanta Airport, a friend of mine came to pick me up from the airport. Uh, on the drive between the airport and where he lived, where which was actually where I was going, I was taught the first lesson about where how about belonging as a black man in Finland. Uh, in that right, he said, they said, welcome to Finland. There are three jobs you can do. Dishwasher, a cleaner, and post delivery person. This is where you belong. I, and uh, it tells how people enter a space. That's my introduction to Finland. I entered in Finland knowing that this is where I belong. And uh, it's, it's, it's something which a lot of people look like me have heard that story. They've been told that, and they have experienced that. So 
how we live in Finland, how we socialize and what, how we plan to become what we want to become is also on that backdrop. Because that backdrop isn't just a myth, it was created by certain realities around us. You know, I don't speak Finnish. I have not been here close to going to what, 15 years. I have Finnish children, but I don't speak Finnish. Uh, because when I came to Finland, I realized that uh, there was this, well, not just when I came here, but throughout my being in Finland, the whole idea is that to be successful, you have to speak Finnish. And uh, then when you speak Finnish, you're going to go to an uh, integration process where you're going to uh, put you into a space which the country needs. But I realized that, no, that's not what I, I want to be. I, 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 I sat down a few years ago and I looked around and I said, okay, I realized there were different kinds of immigrants in Finland. Uh, the immigrants who spoke who speak Finnish and those who didn't speak Finnish. They also didn't speak Finnish, or the ones who didn't speak Finnish and were struggling. Most of them existed, or there was, the, where they belonged was at the bottom. But then there was another group which belonged at the top, which were called experts. They're the ones who didn't speak Finnish at all, but they were living a wonderful life. I'm like, no, 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 no. There was something dramatically wrong with this whole structure. I don't want to learn Finnish to be there. I want to <laughs> learn to become an expert to, to be there. You know, so I made a choice not to speak Finnish, but to learn to become an expert. And that's why I'm here. You see, so it's also about the different strategies that people take in terms of who, who belonging in a space and learning to how you, how you socialize and, and how you become what you want to become. So just just fifty fifty support I can see for now. Thank you. Uh, Noah, maybe you would want also want to react on this question. And I especially was thinking about uh, uh, like the activism related to financial structures and power in, in, in museums, like how you become how you become uh, a person who who has the who has the agency on that world, like uh, maybe the answer is quite clear, obvious. I don't know, but it's also kind of interesting to see like uh, how certain people, maybe yourself, your own position also is first perceived. What does it um, requires you to be in the position to challenge the and uh, gather gather people to challenge the public in, or the institution, art institution uh, as such, or something like that, uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, I could be, I could speak as a self-critical activist actually on this, because, to speak of power, because basically, um, you know, I think in the arts, especially, the visibility is obviously very important, right? And, and because like, what are museums, what are museums, they're like, you know, machines for for making things visible. That's what that's the that's what the walls are for, right? <laughs> and the spaces to think, look at look closely at stuff. And 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 so of course it matters what what uh, <clears throat> what is being seen, who's making it. It's all it's all hyper conscious in the art world, right? And and so um, and power. The question of power you asked, you know, it works on that logic of visibility. Because the, the reason the elites of the, all the biggest financial and, every, and pharmaceutical and every kind of corporation are usually linked to museums is because they're getting something from that logic of visibility. When, when, and maybe they're getting some you know, brand washing or something. Well, activists, activism works the same way. And so what I realized is that when you start making, challenging the system, you actually tap into that logic of visibility to press tends to cover it in cultural activism because you're creating a new, you're helping co-creating a, a new instance of the contemporary moment, right? Because you're doing something, you're making an action. It's almost like making an artwork, right? So, uh, and then to be self-critical there, I think that, that, that that kind of power is problematic and, and it's power, right? And activists are somehow tapping into that market too. And it's actually not that hard <laughs> if you just say, oh, okay, I'm going to burn some bridges here and do 
something crazy, it almost always works because everybody's going to show up for the event, basically, and everyone's going to start talking about it on social media. So I think that, um, you know, I mean, it's the activism we did was coming out of values and reasons and about labor struggles and other things. But uh, that that's one thing I want to put my finger on is that dynamic around, in some ways, tapping into this common market of cultural capital and visibility. And I think that that, I, I feel like that is a, that's something that activists could reflect on more. Because for example, there's certain public exhibitions that they're so famous that activists can't resist doing actions there. And I feel like it's a little bit, ultimately the question I have at least is that, is that perhaps extracting from the public sphere also, as well as building up, as well as fighting for justice, right? Because there's something in the way that the visibility is actually created by the public, that it would not be visible if the public wasn't giving their uh, you know, attention to something, right? So I think in this day, in the attention at outrage economies that are, you know, had, it popped up in the last years, we have to be careful with like how we're giving to the sphere and not only extracting from it. And I think especially activists may, may have to think, th think on that one. Can I just briefly yeah. add something to what you know, I just said? Uh, I, I just finished teaching a course uh, in which we had a discussion about power. And um, the first day of the course, I, just, I told my students that there's this whole mighty force, this power, this whole thing that we can't, we can't break. We, uh, we are powerless to power, and power is just, we are all uh, powerless. And they listen keenly. The next day, the next week, I came and said, you know, you are all agents of power because you all represent different clusters of power. So basically, as an anti-racist, one of the things I, 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 I have to talk about is that to be an anti-racist, you have to have power because you are trying to make a change. And so, and you're fighting against the power structure, but you also embody power. So we all embody power. The point is that because you cannot create change without realizing that you are an embodiment of power. So we are all, we have different variations of power that we all, we all, we all embody. And uh, the most important, that's why I said in my talk that we need to think about, we need to pick up fights we can win. Because we've got power to create a specific kind of change. But the question is that what kind of change or how strong, how powerful is your power, how powerful is the reach of your power. Because power cannot just crumble. Power needs to kind of just take several digs at power for it to actually crumble. So all these different power interventions that we are kind of poking at the power, it's what we need to kind of create a change in the world. Yeah. Uh, I was wanted to mingle a bit too, just to, I can, have you ask your question also, so maybe a bit clearer, because uh, both of these, I was also, I wanted to ask this first question to lead you in a way actually on this conversation, so nicely had it happened, but uh, <laughs> uh, wanted to like think about maybe an exa like example, or, because think about urban planning and what you are working on, is that like you mentioned that okay there's a different kind of people, or people coming from different education background or disciplines who might be connected to like, to understand and think and imagine what city can be and be how people are connecting to each other. Uh, but then I was thinking when you mentioned it, that okay, yes, there's always education, there is always like structures which kind of leads you into that position uh, where you can maybe have an agency or say something. Uh, so. And uh, related to what Noah said, also what Alamanchi you were saying, saying uh, that like how you in that field too, like how much you need to be inside the power structure, inside the like field of education, inside the urban planning thinking in order to uh, affect it, or what the city is. And then I'm coming to that, that is, is there an example in a way, is there like a maybe concrete or some kind of example where city is taught or public's publicness or city space is taught from the uh, perspective 
without being expert, without being tapped into that uh, power structure. Yeah, yeah, actually, I started thinking about the power, um, maybe topic related to urban planning is that um, we all use um, the, the city or public spaces or any kind of spaces in our everyday lives, but then um, many times when we've been running workshops in schools, for example, or in high schools, elementary schools, wherever, um, I feel like people have commented that they haven't realized to kind of look at the space that they are using, even though they use them every day or take, they take the bus or they come to school every day, for example. But then when we start talking about the, the topic of urban planning and how these places came to be as they are now, um, the, the youngsters have kind of commented that they haven't thought about it previously, but now that they start thinking about it, they start wonder, wondering like, okay, but who made this de decision that this place looks like it does nowadays, or why do we have shops like this, or why do we have services like this, or why is our transportation um, organized like this? Um, so I think there's, there's definitely a lot of power in acknowledging that, okay, these processes are happening around us and maybe being able to kind of like see them, um, because of course, um, if you don't think about it, you kind of don't have to think about it unless something is against you or something goes uh, wrong. And that's also related to, to of course, like intersectionality and like different, um, different people um, experiencing spaces differently. So something that might work for me, so I haven't ever paid any attention to any of it because it haven't bothered, hasn't bothered me, might um, be a place where somebody else doesn't feel safe, for example, and it bothers them. So then they have paid, paid attention to it, but I haven't had to do it. Um, and I think also with, with urban space and kind of realizing that we have these we have this power to also impact how especially like the future cities will look like or uh, how the de developments are done in our cities and um, some of these ideas of course like come um, before our eyes very concretely if you travel and you see different kinds of cities, be it like within Finland you see different kinds of villages or bigger cities or if you go abroad and you see different different spaces and you realize like okay um, why is something working very well in some other place but not in Helsinki and why do we have something nice in Helsinki but in some other place there isn't such a structure for example or infrastructure maybe. So I think in that sense it's, it's very true that all of us have powers uh, Alemanji stated, and um, it's of course a huge resource if we can kind of see that power and use it for the betterment of society or um, spaces in general. Thanks. Uh, we are running kind of almost out of time. Time goes quickly, but I just wanted to uh, ask one, maybe a quick reaction from you, and then maybe if there's some co questions and ask comments from the audience. But I want just to like maybe go, go back. Uh, I had a um, uh, actually I was a couple of weeks ago in New York, and I, we met with Noah very quickly in New York and spoke uh, about this uh, and also some thema thematics and things related to the conversation. Um, and then Noah, you were, you mentioned that like in a way a little bit provocative. Provo it's a kind of provocative claim also for me and uh, maybe maybe for uh, maybe for uh, in the conversation that. Uh, in a way, there cannot be, I don't know, maybe it is not like a what you directly say, but I try to remember. You can maybe uh, elaborate a little bit this. Uh, you mentioned that there cannot be um, a class or redistribution without certain different, uh, some kind of universalism, some kind of idea that this redistribution, this uh, distribution of power is good for all, for, for everyone. And I think this is something which I think has been touched upon here. Somehow, also thinking about Mila, you were speaking about different uh, like s approaches, different people's view on the city. Different, uh, there are different experiences. There are different uh, backgrounds. Uh, there are different uh, bodies. There are different minds uh, who wants to have a, 
voice who say something. And of course there are then uh, people who come uh, like uh, have a come from the different uh, elements you were speaking about your own experience coming from somewhere and pointed out that okay there is like these jobs where you can what you can do uh, and this is the real and that's also completely different experience than I have being in this geographic area uh, and then when we are speaking about uh, redistribution and saying that okay there's some certain kind of a way of redistribution power uh, which should be good for all uh, good for uh, uh, and that's maybe what what universalism means in this occasion or how I read Noah your uh, provocation or comment in the New York when we were discussing and maybe this comes back to this question of uh, um, leftist populism and identity politics or different uh, kind of uh, uh, relationships. No, I just wanted to like maybe you can elaborate a little bit this and then maybe if some Mila and Alemachi want to comment somehow. Yeah, so I'll try to be brief about it. I mean, so I, I think about the term universalism, I think because it seems like that is a term that is very much out of fashion right now. And, and, and for a good reason in a way, right? Because nobody can figure out what universalism that would look, what, what that would look like. The uh, 20th century, you know, states and philosophies that we're speaking a lot about universalism have been shown to be, uh, have been, have, we understand the problematic uh, of those. Like for example, you know, the people refer in the US back to the mid 20th century sort of JFK era universalist, post-war universalist language. And now people can see, oh, well, that was, you know, that was good, but there was also redlining going on at that time, meaning that black people weren't able to get home loans, <laughs> you know, instead, I mean, as a matter of course. So people realized that that universalism was not very universal in a way. But the, what's interesting is that the language was being used and people, I think, believed in it. And that was also in a way the push towards the civil rights movement was, I think, about as they say, a more perfect, uh, perfecting that idea. So, uh, and I think it's a problem that we don't have it now. And I think that, uh, you know, groups, we see the polarization and groups on the left and right, everyone's kind of pushing out and, uh, and in separate conversations. And uh, I don't see, I think that the, like a back to the zero sum game, I think the problem is that it's like one issue pops up and makes itself clear and that literally creates the counter power. So that's what's happening now in the US. If you push, if a left wing, you know, if, it, if, the, def if the police actions are brought up, that literally creates the, pot, the, the opposite reaction on the right and it sort of cancels itself out. So it doesn't look like, and, and, and it's not even as clear as it looks like, because it's actually like in New York, we just got a new mayor completely elected by black, by most, by almost all the black population in New York. And they were running for more police so people are like, well, how could this happen? And that's, that's the complexity of the whole thing. It was actually a complexity that, that, that is, is real. So I think that in some ways the question is with redistribution, it has to be tied to like, this, like, a, like the complete public. Otherwise, what are you talking about? Otherwise you're really creating problems as you're trying to redistribute. You know, so, and I, and I, I don't even know, I guess I'll, pass the mic over to other people to continue that thought because it's a big one and it's hard to think through. Do you want to react? No? <laughs> Too much? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Definitely um, very difficult but very interesting topic and I think um, maybe not even that related to this but uh, came to my mind that when we first started working on on urban planning and um, our company, we were uh, mostly focusing on um, maybe socially like inclusive urban planning, feminist urban planning perspectives like these. But then after some, some years and more experience in the field, we realized that um, maybe that's too much of a narrower perspective on urban planning as well, because it's always connected to, to wealth as we've been talking about. Um, today, but it's also uh, connected to um, ecological uh, sustainability or um, equity and all of these topics are so interconnected that it's qu quite difficult to talk about like um, social equity or 
um, feminism or topics like this without discussing um, wealth or discussing ecological impacts or, or these kind of things. So definitely these are all um, things that can be taken separately and um, should be considered like as a whole. But then it becomes so complicated to talk about it that it's even like <laughs> impossible to say anything anymore. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can take this discussion in many different places, but I want to, I want to do it very simple. Uh, I was once asked by, by my oldest daughter, that why is it when we go to a finish shop, you have all these fruits, all these vegetables, which are not farmed here, and they are here at a very affordable price. And what happens to the places where these fruits are coming from? And that's an example of that tells that shows how we are all complicit in this whole, and we are all benefiting from the power structure, like the present power structures that we have. Because sometimes people would say, "But I don't really benefit from this." I'm like, <laughs> "We all benefit from it," you know. And this is just this is basic understand uh, example that we can go to any shop, just any shop in Finland, you can buy apples or. Can buy an apple, buy coconut, buy plantain throughout the year. Why is that possible? You know, where this, where, where I come from, for example, I grew up where there was two mango trees in my back in my backyard. But at some point, the mangoes, there was a harvest in the mangoes before they were even ready. So now we don't have mangoes, but now all the mangoes that we farm are here. You know, in friendly shops, at an affordable price for everyone. So, what I'm trying to reiterate here is that the West is rich because the West is poor, and that's a system that is that that's the reality in which we live in. And sometimes we do not see it; we don't even think about it. But whatever we have here is because people somewhere else do not have, or have taken away the pushing from those people to be able to have that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, nice to end here at this part. Uh, now I just want to... What? Yeah, one question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have time for one question. Uh, anyone in the audience? Everyone with a big like... Oh, yeah. Um, thank you all for a really interesting talk. I just wanted to return to the recent comment by Noah on the necessity for universalism to have redistribution, which I think you rightly commented is quite kind of a contentious statement. And I think the idea, it just made me reflect, this is perhaps more a reflection than a question. Um, who is ready for this redistribution or what is that imaginary that we're all at the same line? Because I, I think like do, does everyone even want to be considered the same? And um, for us all to be included perhaps in one imaginary ideal um, is already for me disingenuous as a like recognition of everybody's experience. And I think while well, the intention to redistribute is perhaps like, it seems like it has so much virtue, um, how does that exist even economically without the idea of reparations, without kind of historically addressing already such a deficit in like not just opportunity but kind of access and kind of investment and and therefore like structural decision making and choice and influence not just as someone who is participating or invited into the kind of discussion but rather that is on the kind of board and kind of yeah making the choices and it's it's just something I reflect on I don't know what the other sentiments are but I think it's it's really necessary to discuss and reflect on, but I, I, for me, I personally find the idea of a universalism like a very tricky trap like to get into because it reduces all the effects of, or the kind of attempted progress people try to make together, which kind of needs a kind of recognition and tolerance above kind of maybe these, these binary ideals. No, do you want to say something? Uh, just briefly, I think that, yeah, so I, I wanted to present universalism as a tricky trap indeed, because basically, uh, I mean, 
we, there's a lot of work being done all over the world in terms of looking at history and understanding, wow, there's, you know, like you're saying, you look around and everything is how it is. And people are in one neighborhood or unable to cross one border or farming mangoes for a cheap price. And when it's all, there's a, it's all there. I mean, history brought us to this point, right? So to say universalism means wiping away history is obviously not going to work and not a left position, <laughs> you know, and I don't think it's any position. I mean, because the right wing has their own idea of history, as we can see with Putin and stuff. Right. So basically, uh, no, it has to go together. Of course, it has to go together. Reparations has to, in the U.S. has in other places has to be part of it. Right. And I speak as a Jewish person who my understanding of reparations, you know, has, it's like, what if there was no reparations from the Holocaust? Well, guess what? There are reparations, have been reparations. Germany has been paying reparations. So my understanding is like that. If you want to shift power, you have to have reparations. But however, it, I still think that it's very unfashionable to speak of universalism. And that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. It's very fashionable to say, well, we can't have universalism because X, Y, and Z reasons. And I think that that's a, that's a problem because it's just, it's just ultimately really contributing. I mean, the work has to be done, the deeper anti-racist, the structural work, all that has to be done. And also, I think it would be much more helpful if a, a universal language can be reconstructed where everyone, instead of saying half the country you know, is just backwards. We're not going to think about them. We're going to at least just talk about the people who are enlightened and, and want to change. It, that doesn't work. It has to be everybody somehow uh, a language for everyone. And maybe it's different in Finland. In the U.S., it really does seem like it's, uh, it, it seems like people are sort of like not interested in each other very much <laughs> right now. Yeah, just one short thing. Just one to just add. Um, power is not uh, giving. Power is taking. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> really nice to end here. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we have to close it quite quickly to, in order to get uh, Caroline Kuchia's performance uh, to go to there. Uh, I just want to say quickly that thanks a lot. Um, where where I am not? I have to say this one. Um, I want to thank all of our partners. I want to thank uh, also Maria and Yemina from the Museum of Architecture specifically on uh, organizing this. Uh, also Lisa and Sonia from Stop Hatred. Lisa is here. Uh, and I want to talk, thank all of our speakers. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and then also thanks a lot for Anse and Camilla uh, doing the technical thing and Reisha producing the whole thing. Uh, and yes, and for frame team in general. Uh, and then we are continuing the program in uh, October 22, uh, so next autumn, uh, around these questions and how they maybe more specifically relate also on, on hospitality and what's the trouble of the hospitality which has been like noticed last three years. It has a lot of troubles and maybe here was some, some, some of them opened up. Uh, thanks a lot. And, uh, Caroline's performance starts at the back door of the museum, so about now, so crush there, back outdoor door. Thank you. so you can give us feedback through a web survey. Thank you.